Interestingly, in most of the cases where we found a hit, only three of the four possible haplotypes occurred in the sample. One was either not there at all, or maybe five cases, seven controls. That was about the worst. That was very interesting. So these things are rare. We're finding rare things. Which is not surprising that you won't find them replicated anywhere. That's my guess. All right? They're either wrong, what I'm going to show you, or they're rare and therefore not replicable easily. So the results are, we use the same cutoff p-value as the Wellcome Trust used, 5 times 10 to the minus 7. And they argued why it should. Some people say you should use 5 times 10 to the minus 8. That's a proper bone for only a line for everything. They used that. Anyway, we just did the same. I replicated, first of all, the 1-1 one, one test that, that, that we got the, the hit on uh, for coronary artery disease that they found, no problem. But then we found a lot more. We found some of these markers in three genes and three non-protein coding regions for coronary artery disease, extra. And we also found these markers in five genes and four non-protein coding regions for hypertension, extra which was sort of interesting. And this is called a Manhattan plot. And for those of you who are statisticians, all it means is it looks like the Manhattan skyline. That's why it's called a Manhattan plot. Basically, what you've got on the left here is minus log to the base 10, the p-value. And so these things are very significant. You've got these p-values, and you see this wonderful hit we got up here. We had to break this here to get it, all right? And this is their cutoff, all right? This is the, 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 the cutoff that the Wellcome Trust used. And you can see we found this one on chromosome 9. Uh, they'd already found it, and all these extra little things. And similarly here, these extra things, they found nothing for hypertension. So I think that's very interesting. As I told you that. Can I ask a question? Yes. On that Manhattan plot, the top one, yeah. it looks like there's actually like a line of dots they're all very close to each other. They're, all, they're just very close to each other. They're right. actually like a peak. Right. This is what you tend to find when you've got right. some. If you've got dense markers, you tend to see it's this. That region. That yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the actual top one is the peak, you know, and, and the others, they're because they're close, because they're correlated. So they're correlated because they're all close physically. Close. Right. Right. The physical, well, I should say it's... Yeah. Well, now we get to, you can think of it as physical, but the geneticists want to call it the genetic distance is small, okay. which is correlated with the physical distance, all right? Yes? Do you do sort of any interactions between that coronary artery disease and your hypertension effects? Absolutely no. We found no overlapping ones. But interactions but in your statistical effects, so... It wasn't that the, it was the same gene, but those genes might have epistasis between the two. Well, it might. We didn't check that. Okay. We didn't check that. But we found no overlapping. Very. But you could use your same modeling and just include... Of course you them. can. You put in all sorts of things. <laughs> you can go on and on forever. But then you still have and a this model problems. Right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I'm saying, now, the 2-2 two, two test, the 2-3... I'm saying they're identical, so it's not like we doubled, really. They're the 2-2 so two, two test and the 2-3 is... Gave virtually the same answers. Right. Okay. But that's that SNPs, and that's not including different diseases in the model, if I'm understanding. Sorry. The, 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 so one has the cross product and the other doesn't have it. Okay. okay. That's the only difference. But they were so alike. I mean, I don't, this was not gene... This is not model hunting, really, because they gave identical answers. That was one of our findings. Okay. I didn't expect it, actually. I thought that I thought the two, three would be better. Right. I thought it would be quite a bit better. But, but, but with hindsight, I can say, aha, the reason it's not that much better is because we only find 500,000 SNPs. Had we had a million, it might have well have been better. Right? Yeah. So, comes to the conclusion, I suppose, why does two-marker analysis work? Why does it work? And then, so, so I had this fellow, pediatric genetics, 
but he wanted to do some genetic epidemiology. So uh, he's the one that came up with this, which I hadn't noticed. He drew this figure. So what we have here is, see, uh, here is our real disease. And this might be you know, associated with if we do one marker. Uh, well, I was trying to show too much in the same one figure. But think of this and this. Forget this one. This was just to show how the ordering thing is disequilibrium, how, how you test the time close to it. But put that one away. There's the real disease here. You've got this one and this one. Now, prior to typing, this could be a heterozygote, capital A, little a, or a homozygote. And similarly, little a, little a, capital A, capital A. Similarly, this one over here. But if they both happen to be heterozygote, then what you do is you find, instead of all these possibilities, you're restricted it to these. And what these are the, these are what I call the different types, the two locus haplotypes, if you want. All right? And you've restricted it. So if this at uh, this marker were capital A little a, uh, well, suppose this were homozygote, capital A capital, or little a little a, gives you no information. You wouldn't be able to find all these. And so if this was homozygous, you wouldn't be able to find them. It's only in those situations where these two flanking markers happen to be heterozygote, you get this haplotype information. And so, you know, I, that's where it stands right now. So, of course, I've been wanting since the other stuff that worked to do this. This fellow does it. We submit it. And uh, before we show you that, let's see. What are my conclusions? These are my conclusions. The best two market test always appears to be more powerful than either the best single market test or the haplotype based test. Well, I mean, Everybody's been doing, you must do single markers first. I don't know why. That's the first thing I noticed. It should be possible by examining the linkage decision or correlation structure of the markers to predict which test will be the best, which will be which the best two marker test to perform. Got a student now looking at this. That statement might be wrong. Not sure yet. And for those of you who've ever heard me talk, give a lecture, there are always words in gold written at the top. What the the teacher may be wrong. <laughs> All right? Always. I'm telling you this because this is what I thought. May be wrong. But I it may be right. I don't know. It seems to me intuitively you should be able to. And we probably need to study maybe more than two marks. I don't know. Maybe two markers is the optimum. Maybe you don't want three marks a time. I don't know. So now, for those of you who would like to study more. The first bit was done by Solgi Kim. Well, the very first bit, the, 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 the uh, Venn diagram was Sun Ho Wan, and uh, Solgi Kim wrote basically this paper, which is there, and you can read all the details in it, all the gory mathematical details. All right. Some of the statements I've made are proved in there, and the assumptions carefully given. The second paper is this one. Two mark associates yield new disease association of coronary artery and hypertension. Here it is. I'm still waiting to hear. Uh, we were told that we would resubmit it. And if we resubmitted it within whatever it was, it, we had to submit it by a certain date for it not to go back to the reviewers. We did that, but I think it's gone back to the reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> the reviewers brought up good points. You know, we really should look at the original data, those plots, those clusters, see what they're like. Well, that's far too difficult for us to do. Also, how much, and we know this is not all type 1 error. Never been replicated. Did we try it? No, we can't replicate. And even if you go back to some of these big replication studies, you've got to realize we're finding rare things. And one thing we did, we did try and replicate. And one thing we found was that if you just have hypertension, or not hypertension, we got a p-value of, I don't know, 0.3 something. 
But once we restricted it to the phenotype that they mention in the Wellcome Trust paper, got to be under this age, over that, this, that, that, the p-value went down to about 0.1. I'm sure you've got to be very specific. You can't just say hypertension, not hypertension. You've got to be very specific. And I, my guess is we found some rare things, and which have pretty large effects. But, you know, I can't prove it that. <laughs> If this gets published, and I think it should be, then other people can try and do exactly what we did in another sample. If we wanted to go to one of these consortia and say, give us your data, we want to do this, you know what's going to happen. It goes to the committee, it'll be six months before we get permission, and they'll say, no, you can't, you've got to tell us, and we'll do it. <laughs> you, I mean, this is, so that's why I think this should be published, whether right or wrong, because I want the others to do it. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. I'm, I can live with that. I've been wrong in the past. I've been right in the past too, so it doesn't work. So with that, thank you very much.